Yeah. How did you first get into it? Right back in the kind of day, because you're on. You've done all these animation shows and things like this. You also did the, the very early days of Doctor Who, Strange mm-hmm. Bad Times, Marvel. How did you get involved right at the start? Well, I mean, as long as I can remember, I've wanted to do comic books. Uh, I mean, I remember getting my first Superman comic when I was maybe seven, and very shortly after that, I started to, you know, draw my own comics. But I, I thought they were drawn the same size as they appeared in print, so that's why. I know wear glasses because <laughs> I draw them all really small. My my dad used to work in town planning, so they used to have loads of, of uh, plans that once they'd been passed through the council were going to be chucked out. So he used to bring home big stacks of these cut up plans that I could draw on the back of. So there was always plenty of paper and everything. My dad used to draw plans himself, so there were always pencils, pens, ink, drawing boards, angle poise lights in the house. So it always just seemed a natural thing to do. So. I used to make up my own characters when I was a kid. In fact, Night Owl was a character I made up when, when I was a kid. Um, and uh, it's wonderful that you know he's come come all that way. So he's probably my favourite Watchmen character. But um, then I did stuff for fanzines. Um, and then I did stuff for underground comics. And then I worked very close to IPC, who were the biggest publishers of comics at that time. And I used to, used to go in in the lunch hour and look over people's shoulders. I looked over the shoulder of a guy called Steve Parkhouse and learned how to letter. I saw how he would rule it out and the pens he would use. And then I started doing balloon lettering, which was great because I'd get pages of artwork every week and I'd have hours to study them while I was lettering them. Then I start, Then I got work for DC Thompson in Dundee, who were wonderful. That was really where I got the, really got the rough edges knocked off because you'd send them the pencils and they'd send them back to you with overlays, with notes and suggestions. Not artsy-fartsy suggestions, but practical storytelling suggestions. So that was really my, my education. And then 2000 AD came along, which kind of was the clubhouse for all the people like me who'd grown up loving American comics and were really the first generation that had just wanted to do comics. Before that, comic artists always had dreams of being painters or magazine illustrators. Comic book writers were always thinking about writing their novel. But we were the, we were the lunatics who'd taken over the asylum. 2000 AD was the breeding ground for so many of us who have gone yeah. on to do other things since. It's got to be, apart from it being undoubtedly the longest running comic ever, it's quite f- fantastic really. And I think a lot of it is due to the incredible surge of thrill power, is what you'd have to call it, that Pat Mills and John Wagner gave it. I mean, Pat was such a powerhouse from the beginning, he was full of energy, and he motivated so many of us to do our really best work. And I think there's always also been that feeling with 2000 AD where you know it was kind of friendly competition you're on some kind of team and you, you want to play as well as your teammates are playing and you don't want to let them down so there's always been that wonderful esprit de corps and I think now it's gone for so long you can see sort of almost like different geological ages of 2000 AD and there's always something in it that, that I like they send me a copy every week even if the rest of it's in a bit of a down spot Dread is always good John's still writing Dread um yeah, it is an absolute phenomenon. It's a shame that British comic publishing didn't latch on to what made it successful and tr- try and do more comics in that kind of way. But Why do you think that is? What, what happened to the industry that didn't grasp onto this kind of next thing that you were doing? Well, it was sort of out, out of their control, you see. It was, it was a bit like what happened in American comics as well, because it used to be the characters and the properties that were valuable. But that changed. It started to be the, the creators who were popular. And publishers don't like that because you can go along and say, look, you know, the minute you start to put people's credits on stories, and that was an innovation in 2000 AD, and Kevin O'Neill, who was the art editor at the time, who's later gone on to do wonderful stuff for League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, he was instrumental in that. And the minute that people can write in and say, I really like Mick McMahon's artwork, or I really like Brian Boyd, you can go to the publisher and say, I want a better deal, or oh, I'm going to go across the street because they phoned me up from America, you know. Um, so I think that it was out of the publisher's control to an extent, and they didn't, I don't think they ever understood 2000 AD. It was a huge hit, but I don't think the board at, uh, at uh, Fleetway IPC ever quite knew why. And when they brought out a comic called Heroes, which was supposed to be a companion to 2000 AD, they thought, oh, we can't call it Heroes, which would have been a fantastic title. They called it Tornado. They said, let's have another comic named after a, a jet plane or a racing car. You know, it's just so backward looking. You have this great legacy of working with Kevin O'Neill and Chris McMahon and Chris Strauss and Peter Gabriel and so on. What's the one thing in particular in each of the days I don't list you from in your interview that you look forward to as the sort of defining moment in your career that you're most 
Well, that's very difficult. And quite often as artists, we're the worst judges of our own work. So it tends to be things you really enjoyed working on. Obviously, Watchmen was and has been, I think, you know, the defining moment. I mean, I, in a morbid way, I joke that in the far distant future, when my obituary is written, the word Watchmen is going to be in the first three lines, <laughs> arguably the first line. Um, so that that was great. I love the Superman story that I did with Alan called For the Man Who Has Everything, because it was Superman, apart from being Alan, who's a friend and a great writer, it was Superman. It was done for an editor called Julius Schwartz, who edited all my favourite American comic books when I was a kid. It would be that. And it, there's a little short story called Chrono Cops, which was a thing that Alan and I did for 2018, that was almost like the, the embryo of Watchmen, the first time we realised you could do something 